Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you're able to join us this morning as we worship God. Zephaniah 3, verse 15 through 17 says this, The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. That is the hope that we have as Christians. Um, and I, I invite you this morning as, as we sing praise to God, that you would um, just keep that on, on your minds and in your hearts. Please join us as we sing.
Well, good morning, church. My name's Dave, one of the pastors here, and it's great to be able to welcome you to our online service this morning. Uh, whether you're a regular, and uh, this has been your practice for uh, many, many weeks now, joining us on a Sunday morning online, or whether today's the first time and uh, you've tuned in to join us, uh, to check us out, uh, maybe uh, found us on our website or some, some other way, uh, we're glad that you're here, and it's great to be able to open God's Word together, uh, to sing His praise wherever we are, and uh, to be connected uh, to one another and to our God as we worship in this way. Uh, if you've got your uh, newsletter in the week uh, on email, there's some important things to, uh, uh, to take note of in there. Check your bulletin for all of the uh, up-to-date information about what's coming, coming up. Uh, I'll mention a couple of things in a moment, but before I forget, this morning we're going to be sharing uh, at the communion table uh, together. Uh, so if you've uh, got some, uh, something to eat and something to drink there, maybe some bread or some juice like I've got here, uh, in a little uh, moment uh, later on you'll be able to join us as we remember uh, Jesus uh, in that way. A uh, couple of uh, things just to remind you of uh, from the newsletter. One is that uh, our service will resume here in the church next Sunday on uh, July 12. Uh, that's our, our plan. Uh, we do need to take some details for our COVID tracking. Uh, so come early. Uh, come early. Service starts at 9 o'clock. Uh, but I would say come earlier than that uh, so that you can give us your details uh, and we can uh, get you uh, in uh, on time for our service start. Uh, also, starting next week, our integrated study, uh, which is on the theme of discipleship, uh, is going to be kicking off. Uh, Pastor Lode is going to be uh, uh, preaching our first series uh, in, a, in a, a few weeks' worth of messages uh, around this topic of discipleship. And as a whole church-wide integrated study, we'll all be uh, learning that together. Uh, there are booklets uh, that have been produced um, that uh, will be available next Sunday, uh, but you can also collect those uh, from the office if you wish. Uh, from July 7. Uh, but uh, whether that's earlier from July 7 or next week, you'll be able to get those booklets. Um, we have a habit of worshipping God uh, in the giving of our tithes and our offerings, and uh, we're going to do that now. Uh, there'll be a little button that will come up uh, in the chat window for those of you that uh, do your giving online. Uh, you are still able to, uh, to come in uh, during the week and uh, do your giving in person uh, in the office if you wish. But let's uh, bow in prayer and uh, we'll open this service uh, together. Loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you as we've just been singing for your uh, grace to us in Jesus, the Savior, the one who came and, and died in our place so that we could be right with you. Father, we do just want to commit this time to you this morning, wherever we are, in our, in our homes gathered together around our uh, computers or TVs or iPads, together but apart, still worshiping the one true God. We thank you for uh, that sense of connectedness, that, that joy we have of being a part of your heavenly family, brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we do long to join together in person next week and, uh, and meet again and worship uh, together uh, as, as we can. And we do pray uh, your blessing over that service. Lord, we pray a blessing as, uh, on the whole church as we begin an integrated study looking at this uh, topic of discipleship. Lord, just prepare our hearts even now for that which you'll be teaching us over the, the next number of weeks as we grow in your word together. Father, we do thank you for uh, the gifts that you give to us, for every good gift. And Lord, as we present our gifts and our offerings to you uh, now or, or later during the week, Lord, again, we just acknowledge uh, this is an act of worship that we do to you, our God. Thank you for every blessing that you give to us. May we continue to be a generous people, a, a people that reaches out in love and grace with the message of hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, uh, we, we thank you for our time together this morning and we ask your blessing on this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, what we're going to do this morning uh, before we continue singing is just gather and pause for a moment around the communion table. And uh, I was struck uh, during the week as I was uh, preparing for this, just reflecting on Jesus' life and ministry and uh, leading up to his death and resurrection for us at the cross. And that's what we celebrate here at the communion table. And I was reading in uh, John's Gospel, I was struck again by uh, the way Jesus is introduced to us in John chapter 1 
and verse 29. Here we see John the Baptist has been baptizing people in the Jordan River and he's been getting a fair bit of attention uh, from the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And then we see this uh, first time that uh, he is met with Jesus and uh, the Apostle John records this meeting for us in John 1.29. It says, The next day John, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is described as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's a quite an interesting title. Considering the history of God's people, they were very familiar with lambs and sin, uh, particularly the, the sacrifice of lambs. It played a, a, a very important role in the Jewish religious life and sacrificial system. So when John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Jews who heard him would have immediately thought of any number of these several important sacrifices. But probably uh, with the time of the Passover feast being so near uh, to Jesus' arrival here, the first thought they might have had would have been this sacrifice of the Passover lamb. In uh, Exodus chapter 12, uh, verses 2 to 13, we read the instructions that God gave to the nation of Israel on that first Passover feast. God said to his people in Exodus 12, he said, from now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on this 10th day of the month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat the whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be one year old either a sheep or a goat with no defects. Take special care of the chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They're to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with a bit of salad greens and bread made without yeast. Don't eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Don't leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are in your instructions for eating the meal. Be fully dressed. Wear your sandals and carry your stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I'll pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male in the land of Egypt. I'll execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood... I'll pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. God had said to his people that this sacrifice of the lamb would spare them from the judgment that was going to strike the land. That the blood of the lamb on the doorpost would serve as a, as a sign uh, and God would pass over them. The plague of death wouldn't touch them. And this continued as a, a practice for Israel in this Passover feast for more than a thousand years after that first Passover. And then we come to this meeting of Jesus and John the Baptist. And John points to Jesus, this ordinary man on the banks of the Jordan River. And he proclaims of him, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist saw and believed that Jesus was the Messiah. God's promised one, the Christ, the one sacrifice for our sin. And it would be by this sacrifice, by, by his blood that was shed, that God's judgment for sin would also come to pass over us, that we might be saved from our slavery to sin and death. In the New Testament, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, we read these words. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from our ancestors, 
but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Though through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Friends, this morning as uh, we gather in our homes, as we take some bread or some food, whatever, whatever you've got at home, and we eat that this morning together, we remember Jesus, who on, on that night that he was betrayed, uh, after he'd given thanks at the meal, that Passover meal that they shared together with his disciples, he took that bread and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you've got your, your bread or something to eat at home, let's eat that together and remember Jesus. In the same way, after that supper, Jesus took the uh, cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We drink this morning together, though separate, to remember the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who takes away our sin and the sin of the world. Let's drink together and remember Jesus. Lord God, we do thank you for your grace to us, for this precious gift of a Saviour, Jesus Christ, the, the Lamb of God, the once and for all sacrifice for our sin. No longer do we have that painful reminder of death, that sacrificial system that you instituted for your people so long ago is now fulfilled and done away with because of Christ's death for us. Thank you that because of him, we are forgiven. We just want to remember that with gratitude in our hearts this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you join us as we continue to worship our God together? Cling to Christ. 
Christ my hope, His mercy reigns now and forever. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the Well, good morning, everyone. It's a delight to um, be here today and to be able to present the Word of God to you today. Over this last couple of years that uh, I've been the, the back pastoring of the church here, Anne and I have grown to deeply love the church. And one of the hardest things for us has been over these last few months when we have been unable to, uh, to connect with, uh, with the church and we are so looking forward to next Sunday when we'll be able to be together. Well, many, some of us will be able to. And um, if you are able to, to join with us, that would be great. And uh, otherwise, we'll continue to see, see you, or you see us at least, on our television or your television. I really do hope that you have your Bibles with you this morning. If it's in reach, you don't have it, please grab it. And quickly turn with me to Psalm 119. I'd like to read just a section of Psalm 119 to you. And the section I'd like to read to you today is from uh, Psalm 119 from verse 105 through to verse 112. It reads this way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I'll follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I've not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the glory of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Let me talk a little bit about Psalm 119. We in our English versions miss out on some of the richness of, uh, of, of this psalm. Some of you may be aware that this psalm, Psalm 119, is the longest psalm, is the longest chapter in the Bible. It contains a total of 176 verses. There's one word which continually, or one thought which continually occurs throughout this psalm. All but four of the 176 verses refer to the word of God. Now, it doesn't always use that phrase, the word of God. It uses other terms, but 
spread out throughout this psalm. So some of the terms include words like the law, testimony, judgments, statutes, commandments, precepts, word, ordinances, ways. And so, as I say, in all but four verses, one of those words occur. So this psalm is very much centred around the word of God. Another interesting thing about this psalm is that it's divided into 22 sections or 22 stanzas. And if you have your Bible there, you'll see these strange words written on the top of each section. Uh, What these sections are divided into is actually the Hebrew alphabet. And so from the beginning, from verse 1 and going down, you'll see, uh, see these words, Aleph, Baith, Gimel, Daleth, He, Vav. And so it continues right through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But what we also miss in our English version is this, is that each section starts off with the, each verse in each section starts off with the same letter. So in the Aleph, or the first section, every verse starts off with the letter Aleph, or like our letter, the the, the letter A. So all eight verses of uh, of that first section begin with the Aleph. The next section, which is the section called Baith, every verse begins with the letter Baith. And so it continues all the way through. So the psalmist who wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit certainly had his wits about him as he compiled this psalm. So when we look at the section that we are looking at today in, uh, in, from verses 105 to 112, you'll see at the top uh, a strange little squiggle and it's called noon. That's the, or N-U-N, is the way that we would spell it in English. And so every verse begins with the, the letter noon in this section. There's actually only one verse that I want us to focus on, but we can easily divide this, uh, this whole section up into, into a smaller bite sections as well. Verse 105 is informing us about uh, about the word of God, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. Verse 106 then talks about a decision. A decision needs to be made. So verse 105 informing us about the word, the purpose of it. Verse 106 says, I have taken an oath. I have made a decision that I'm going to live by the word of God. And and then verse 107 talks about a testing. Um, It says, I have suffered much. Have you noticed that often when we make a commitment to God, that it's not too long after making that commitment that God allows us to be put to the test in the decision which we have made. And so it is here with the psalmist. This is the word of God, it's there to guide me. I've made the decision to abide by it and now there's this period of testing. But then verse 108 comes back with this consecration where it says, Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your ways. That's a consecration that the psalmist made to being obedient to the word of God. But this morning I want us just to focus on this, uh, this first verse in this section. Psalm 119, verse 105. If you're not in the habit of memorising verses in the Bible, um, then I'd ask you to, to think about that. And here is a fantastic verse to memorise, if you haven't already memorised it. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Reckon you can remember that? Reckon you can memorise it? Well, over the weeks ahead, we might even ask you that question, whether you have memorised that. 
As pastors, one of the most common questions which we are asked is this. How can I know God's will? How can I know what it is that God wants me to do? How can I know the direction, the pathway which God wants me to take? And this verse gives us an insight into that. It says this, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Or, as Eugene Peterson puts it in the message, he says this, By your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. That's often how the journey of life seems to people. It just seems so dark and and dim and we just can't see too far ahead. Uh, It's dark or it's foggy or, or, or we really don't know what lies ahead of us. And if only we knew what the what the way forward might be, um, we would just feel so much more comfortable. And the psalmist here is saying this, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. (coughs) It's a lamp and a light. I guess when this time was written, it was like the, uh, the GPS of that particular era the global positioning system, that uh, this was the, the direct, uh, direction finder and, and the direction setter for, for people in that time. A lamp, of course, uh, gives out a general light. It's a lantern. It's, it's, it's not a focus light, but it's just a general light which we might hold up and, and, and lights around in 180 degrees. We use it for illumination, to, to light up the surrounds. Or we might use it as a beacon, as there is something that we are headed towards which we are are focused on and we're moving towards that. A light, on the other hand, is is focused. It really is direction, finding it's really searching. It's like a searchlight or a torch that we might use that... Rather than just light up the immediate surrounds, we can see further into the, into the future, or into the distance, and we can see what lies ahead. And the psalmist here is saying that God's word is both of these. It lights up my surroundings, my environment, gives me some indication of where I fit in this world right now but it also gives a focus and direction and enables me to see some distance ahead to know what lies ahead for me in the will of God. Well, today, well, we might use a lamp or a light in some circumstances if we're camping, but today we use to find our direction in our cars, we often use a GPS, um, either a dedicated GPS or something on our phone. And, and this morning I want to take those three letters, the G, the P and the S, and then to apply that into how God's word might be used to help us in, um, in knowing about the future, knowing something of God's direction for us. So the G stands for God's kingdom. What are we talking about when we're talking about the kingdom of God? Well, I'm only going to mention it briefly today because in a couple of Sundays' time, we are actually looking at this topic, the kingdom of God, in more detail. The whole message will be focused on this area of the kingdom of God. But but suffice to say that when we are talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the area of God's control. We're talking about the area which God has a say over. And when we are talking about us as being a part of the kingdom of God, we're talking about God having control over our lives, about God having a say in our life. In fact, the Bible continually, always points to this very fact that his people are known as such because they are always living their life in obedience to the commands of God. So that's the G, God's kingdom. But 
the next letter, the letter P, for me stands for progress. Progress always means change. When we have a light on a journey or a GPS, we are talking about making progress towards a goal. And, and here we're talking about progress meaning change. Believe it or not, everybody finds change hard to, to, to accept. In different circumstances, we find change hard. If you're not sure whether you find change hard, when you sit down for your next meal at home, just try sitting in a different seat and see how everybody else in the household responds to that. We went through this period of time when our girls were, were living at home when they were young about setting, uh, not having particular seats for the dinner table. We went through this period of time where, um, where anybody could sit anywhere. It was a bit of an adventure for a while that that uh, we never knew exactly where we were going to sit. Well, I was the first one to cave. And after a period of time of doing this, I said to everybody else, I don't care where anybody else sits, this is my seat and I always expect to sit here. Well, I led that, it wasn't too long before we fell into, uh, into this routine. You see, change is hard for us to, to accept. And, and when we're talking about, about God's economy, we are talking about how change is constantly going on both within and round about us. Of course, we must always remember that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. He never changes. God never changes. But he is working towards this eternal history of which we are a part and change continues to happen round about us. Let me mention a couple of areas. Firstly, there is personal change which needs to be taking place in your life and in mine as followers of Jesus. The Bible continually tells us that the followers of Jesus are continually being transformed from who we are or who we were, more and more being changed into the image or into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. So there's that internal change which takes place. There's also change together as, as, a, as a community. Um, how we structure ourselves, how we uh, conduct our programs, how we do things. A number of years ago, I was in a role where I was consulting with churches and the pastor of a particular country church asked me, to go and talk to his leaders about change. Being a country church, they were reluctant to change and they thought, well, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever, well, we ought to be as well. That, uh, that how we did it way back in, uh, in the 50s and the 60s ought to be okay to continue to do it today. And they had failed to adapt to the changing society around them. It was interesting when I walked into the place where we were meeting, into this public hall, is that I could see some gas piping, just small gas piping uh, running around the, around the ceiling. And although I had never seen it, I guessed immediately that this was something of the leftover from a previous era of when there was gas lighting in this building. So I asked these leaders, is this for carbide or for gas lighting? They immediately said yes and started to tell me how gas lights work. Being a rural community, many of them were farmers and also as a part of the conversation, and this was before our meeting started, I got them to talk with me about how farming used to be done and how farming is done now. And and I pose this question to them just in general conversation. So if somebody tried using those old methods today, how would it go? Oh, they'd never survive. It would never be viable, they said. Little did I, they realise that I was setting them up for when we got into the meeting. Because when we got into the meeting proper, I said to them, isn't it interesting that... Um, that when it comes to lighting, we would never go back to gas lighting, 
But now with electricity, we would want to use electricity all the time. It's, it's the same outcome, but the way we go about it is quite different. And isn't it interesting about farming that we still want the same outcome for our produce on the farm, but we accept that the methodology to get the same outcome has to change. So I said, how does this apply to us as a church today? How does that apply to us as a church today? If we want the same outcome, can we realise that the methodology, the way we go about it, must also change? Well, I'd like to be able to report about this great transformation which took place in this church. Um, sadly, they refused to change and can you continue to struggle and to decline. We must always aim for the out same outcome. That we, God has told us, Jesus has given us the command to disciple the whole world. The, the outcomes are the same which we're after, but the way that we go about them, about achieving this outcome, will change from place to place, from era to era. So there's personal change, there's structural and program change, but there's also needs to be change in the way that we worship as well. The way that we worship needs to be subject to our culture and to generational change, all of these things. I remember some years ago talking with one of my counterparts, the head of a denomination, another denomination, not Baptist, and and he was saying it how at their convention that they had this, uh, this guest speaker. And this guest speaker put this to, to those who were there at the convention. He said, hands up all the grandparents. And so all the grandparents put up their hands. Uh, hands up all the grandparents who really, really love their grandkids. Every hand remained up. Hands up all those grandparents who love their grandkids so much that they would do anything for their grandkids, they would even die for their grandkids. And he said every hand stayed up. And then the speaker said this, isn't it interesting that we say that we love our grandkids, that we would do anything for them, that we would even die for them. And yet we refuse to sing their music in church on a Sunday. There's this deathly silence over the congregation at that time. Now, I'm not advocating that all worship needs to be really up-tempo to suit the, the modern, uh, the younger generation. But what I'm saying is this, is that we're after the same outcome and if in any way we can accommodate young and old and in between, then we need to be doing that. And, and that our worship needs to have this contemporary edge to it that, that we're reflecting something of the journey that we are on with Jesus in the here and now. Progress means change. And we need to say this, is that the only thing permanent around here, the only thing permanent is change. Is that we ought to be continually evaluating things, not changing just for change's sake, but changing so that we might be more effective or efficient for the kingdom of God. G is for God's kingdom, P is for progress, personal, together in our worship in other areas. And the S stands for signposts. Signposts along the way. Just like we, as we're driving along, that we see speed signs and warning signs and, and direction signs, all of these, and we keep an eye out for them on our journey because they help us facilitate uh, the, the journey uh, in, in our progress. And so too in life, the uh, signposts along the way. Signposts like significant moments that happen through life's journey. 
uh, significant times of, of, of like positive things like, like perhaps uh, when we left home or when we got our first job or when we got married, our children were born, the, the list goes on and on. Sometimes it might be negative things, negative experiences about like losing a job or, or, or losing somebody who's closely significant to us. We need to recognise that God uses circumstances, uses these, circum, these signposts in life to guide and to instruct us. To recognise that nothing ever happens just by chance but rather that God allows or sometimes even directs these things to happen so that he might teach us things that might guide, that he might instruct us. Now, while I say that nothing ever happens by chance, I also want to quickly say don't overread situations as well. Sometimes we might go looking for, for, for things which aren't even there, but, uh, but, but we wonder about it. Folk, if there's a significant event that happens to us, then we lay that before the Lord and say, God, is there something that you want to teach me through this? Is there something for me to learn? How do I use this for the next phase of life? God's word, God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It points us to the kingdom of God that we need to come under his instruction. It points us to how change will occur around about us, internal change about the change which takes place within me, being transformed more and more into the image of God. Around about us as well, the the Bible will talk to us about other changes which needs to happen. will also help us to understand signposts things that happen to us in life as we learn from others, uh, from their experiences, we learn from the teaching of others as well. Finally, I want to say this to you this morning when we are talking about the priority of God's word in our lives. I want to say this to, to every one of us this morning, just as a reminder, is that either we are in the word and the word is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ, or else you are in the world and the world is squeezing you into its mould. The psalmist wrote this declaration, said it publicly, but he was speaking to God. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. May we come to a greater understanding of God's word as we read it, meditate on it, memorise it, as we put it into practice in our lives so that we might know God's direction for us for today tomorrow, for the week, the months ahead. Let us pray. This morning, Lord God, we would make this declaration to you. And we do it, well, if there are others around us, we do it publicly to those around about us as well. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning aside, but to live my life in obedience to the word of God as you make it alive in my life. And if this morning you sense that God has spoken to you in some significant way and you'd like to let us know or you'd like some further help in knowing how this applies to you, then on the screen is, is a response button. I'd encourage you to just to press that and to, to fill in the details and we'll do our best to contact you as soon as possible so that we might share together, that we might pray together, that we might be encouraged together. And so, Lord, to this end, we would submit ourselves, we would commit ourselves, we would consecrate ourselves 
Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. For your sake, for the world's sake, for our sake. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to conclude now with a song. Please join us as we respond in song. Everything. 
Father. Lord God Almighty, I thank you that you are constant. And Lord God, although change is always happening, change is consistent, Lord God, I thank you that you are also constant and never changing. Lord God, that we can choose to follow you, that you are our rock and our refuge throughout all the change that happens in our life. And Father God, I just pray that you would be with us throughout our weeks. Lord God, be with us throughout change. And Lord, help us to lean more and more into you each and every day. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pray that you all have a wonderful week.